Okay, this is the BQBX from Big Tree Tech. It's a 3D printer currently available on Kickstarter with about a week left of the campaign. And so far it's raised a few hundred thousand dollars of backing. Big 3D printing companies listing their machines on Kickstarter for crowdfunding isn't really a trend I'm too happy with, but this machine has shown some promise in the week or so I've had with it. So I want to make a quick video showing what I like about it, what I don't like about it, some weird glitches I've run into that I want BQ, Big Tree Tech to fix for the backer versions because I care about you guys. And hopefully in this video, I'm gonna give you just that little bit of extra information you might need to decide whether you want to back this machine on Kickstarter or not. Because it's currently available with a few early bird spots for like 310 US dollars, which is really quite good value if you're considering the specs, but it is Kickstarter, so let's get started. So as I said, I unboxed this machine live on camera about a week ago, and it went fairly smoothly. This machine came straight to me from China, and it's a pre-production unit from Big Tree Tech. So keep that in mind. What you see here is likely to change, and there's some things that I really do hope they do change. And secondly, this isn't a review. I've had this machine for only a short period of time. Usually I take like a month or two to fully properly review a unit and it's pre-production. Things are changing all the time. So I highly recommend you go check out Michael's video over on his channel, Teaching Tech, because although his review was on pre-production units, he got to see like an earlier one and then they had some issues and they fixed it. But in this video, let's talk about what I do like about the BQBX and what I don't like and hope that they change for production units. So let's start with something I like, the dual lead screws for Z. There's two motors and they're independently driven by two separate drivers and they control the Z axis, which will give you a much more precise and rigid machine compared to those that have only one stepper motor on one side. Apart from the dual lead screw though, it is visually similar to machines like the Ender 3 and that's because it uses V rollers on aluminum extrusion. It is not carbon fiber. This is actually just a, uh, picture. It's a uh, hydrographic, apparently not a sticker, but basically it's purely aesthetic. This machine that has no carbon fiber in it at all. There's also a little bit more bling in this machine. It has a light underneath the top extrusion rail that you can change the color. That's purely aesthetic. It has no functionality, but it does again add a bit of differentiation to the printer. Something else I like is the removable print surface. It's a spring steel sheet on a magnetic print surface, but Unlike other magnetic spring steel sheet bed systems I've come across, this is a flexible magnet surface, and unfortunately it isn't really strong enough in my opinion. Now this plate's a little bit um, bowed, so it might just because this plate isn't perfectly flat, and although you'll notice it sort of sticks down okay when the bed's cold, when it warms up to even 60 degrees Celsius, the loss of magnetism due to the Curie effect is enough to make it start bowing up, and you would definitely have it automatically just release if you heated this up to ABS temperatures. While we're talking about the print service, I want to talk about the coating as well. I don't think it's PEI, I think it's just some sort of high temperature paint or something. I could be wrong, but I have damaged it due to something I'll talk about later in the video, um, and it came off very easily. Even with the, the scraper blade to get prints off, um, it, this black sort of powder flaked off it, which is not, not very typical of a PEI coating. So I'm not sure where it is. Uh, it works fine, but it seems to be a little bit less durable than a proper PEI coating would be. Something else I like is this extruder. This is actually probably the best piece of tech on this whole printer. And it's actually available as an add-on for like $69 US or something, which I would highly re recommend doing if you have other printers because it might be worth just retrofitting this extruder to them. It is a really light direct drive extruder. It's actually, they're claiming it's like one of the lightest in the world. I don't know if that's true or not, but it is indeed very small and almost as beneficial as having a Bowden set up, but with all the benefits of direct drive. If they achieved that with a smaller than usual step motor, I think it's NEMA 14 or 15, and it's a geared reduction down to a direct drive unit. And then in the hot end itself, there's a small piece of Capricorn PTFE and then the hot end assembly. And in my experience, it works really, really well. By far one of the coolest things I've seen on a printer of this style for a long time. So I have to give them props for doing something different like that. It's definitely one of the cooler extruders I've found. The thing I don't like about it is the cooling fan implementation is really poor. Um, it's it's there, it's, at, it's in the back. You don't, you can't see it, but it does have one of those sort of thin pancakey, scribble cagey fans. I don't know what you'd call them. Not very powerful at the best of times and it's stuffed in the back with a single direction cooling duct. The prints I've gotten off this machine are actually okay, but they do suffer a little bit of wispy stringing and if you print too fast, 
um, then they do start to suffer drooping and cooling issues. So luckily, BQ has included these tapped holes, I think the M3's tapped holes, two on the top, two on the side, and you could easily attach your own cooling duct. And there's actually a point in the, the breakout board for power if you want to attach another fan or something like that. They have allowed for upgrades in the future because I think you'll definitely need to do it to get the most out of this hot end design. And finally, something that I'm kind of not impressed with, but a little bit ambivalent about is the HDMI connection. Yes, your hot end now takes 4K 60 frames a second. <laughs> um, it's literally an HDMI cable and connector used to transmit the power to the hot end. It's not used for anything else, any sort of images or audio. It's a really strange choice. I have seen some companies use like RS-232 style cables, like the old CRT monitors and that kind of thing, but they lock in place. They made a bit more sense. This one is just using friction fit. It works, but it is a really strange choice, especially considering everything else in this printer seems to be quite custom. I don't know why they went with HDMI, but there it is. It it's just strange. Keeping your belts tension on your 3D printer is really important. And something I do like they've implemented here that a lot of other printers don't have is little wheels that let, let you easily adjust the tension of the X and Y belts. And I can't get away with not talking about the electronics. This machine has one of the largest LCD screens I've ever seen on a 3D printer. It's seven inches and it, you can use it using the traditional Marlin touchscreen interface, or you can attach a Raspberry Pi to the back using a special adapter board. Then you can connect to this machine remotely over the network or even use the Raspberry Pi directly with an on-screen interface. Now I haven't tested this out on this machine. That's because I've been running into a lot of issues with bed level and to get a Raspberry Pi sent to me would cost a lot of money and it's not gonna get here really in time for me to make a concise review before the Kickstarter ends. So that's why I do highly implore you to check out Michael's video over on his channel because he got a Raspberry Pi, tested it out and he said to me that most of these prints were done using the Raspberry Pi interface. So if that's a feature about this machine that you're really interested in, you have to go check his video out. So again, it's below. And in addition to such a huge interface, this machine has silent stepper drivers and a 32-bit control board. It's a fantastic board. The machine itself, the steppers are really quiet, but the fan noise is a little bit loud. You might notice the machine's actually off right now. That's because with the microphone so close, it's actually quite loud with the fans. And also this machine is very um, vocal. So I'm just gonna turn it on and just show you what I mean. So yeah, get used to that sound because it makes it a lot. And especially when I was trying to print off this SD card slot in the side. You see during the stream, I used it to print the demo G-code, which is this dog on this weird platform. But since that stream, I was having repeated issues with corrupted SD cards. And I was also having the files themselves as they were printing throw um, error uh, G code lines. It was really strange. So I was getting prints like this, where um, it was kind of stuffing up and misconstruing uh, G code lines and then coming back to normal. It was like being corrupted as it was printing. And I don't know what's going on. I don't know if it's the, the SD cards. I tried several. I don't know if it's something to do with the firmware or there's a loose connection uh, in the SD slot. I don't know. Either way, this was causing me all manner of grief. Also, prints would just stop as well. And I was about ready to give up on this printer. I was really frustrated. However, this machine also has a micro SD slot in the front, not in the LCD. And you can access it by going to onboard SD. So I started trying to use that and it works pretty much fine. Another differentiation factor this machine has over others in its price point is the bed leveling. It has an induction sensor, induction probe that uses the spring steel sheet to level the nozzle using mesh bed leveling routine. And it was not so great for me. And it's not because the mesh bed leveling wasn't working, but I had huge weird buggy issues with calibrating the Z height offset. Getting mesh bed level is one thing, we need to set the right nozzle height so the first layer is correct, it's not too close, not too far. And I just was having huge issues with that not being remembered properly and stored in EEPROM. And I ended up damaging the bed this way because when the machine came from factory, the, the induction probe was quite far off. So the nozzle was always too close. And you could adjust this but it wasn't remembering it properly. So I ended up adjusting the induction probe to be closer. So the nozzle would be now too far away from the print surface by a few millimeters. And I tried to use the nozzle adjust to get it correct, 
But this is really just frustratingly weird is that when you would try to make it go towards a print service, which it makes it makes more sense to me, you want it to be too far to start and then you just slowly step it down to be uh, correct, it wouldn't go down, but the number would increase. But then when you made it too far away, the number, it would move and the number would change, um, which is clearly to me, at least to me, a firmware uh, bug or issue. Uh, it's something that I'm sure will be fixed, but it meant for these prints, I disabled bed level because it was always too far away or initially with the printer too close. I don't know. I don't know if I was doing it wrong or it was buggy. Either way, not enough time to figure it out. So I just turned bed leveling off and did the manual bed leveling for all of these prints. So I actually found a few files sliced on there and they were sliced in Simplify 3D. And I created a new factory file by using the G code that, were, that I found to create a new profile. And that's what these prints were done on. And this Benchy is actually really quite decent. Uh, it's printed, printed at 0.15 millimeter layer heights and it was printed quite slowly, yes, but the overhangs are good. The start and ends of perimeters aren't great and that's probably partly due to the slicer, but I'm wondering if the direct drive has a little bit of backlash or something that might sort of be limiting its ability to stop and uh, retract. But I'm wondering if that's something to do with it or it's just the profile, again, I'm not sure. But yeah, like the differences between trying to use this buggy slot and the actual onboard one was night and day. And I am so happy I tried it because I was literally ready to just give up. And I just really wanted to bring this video to you guys. I was also keen to test a more detailed model. So I printed this spaceship. Um, I think it's from Star Trek. I'm not too sure. But basically this is scaled down to 75% of the original. And it's got some really fine details on it that the machine kind of couldn't reproduce like tiny little gun turrets. And again, I think it's that stop start extra, uh, extrusion control, uh, which is a little bit too fine, but it's so small, most printers couldn't do it. But really, you've got to be pretty happy with that. This is a really fine model and it printed on the bed like that with just a tiny brim. So a lot of printers would have knocked that down or gotten really bad artifacts at the top. I think that's partly because it has really conservative accelerations. I actually increased them during the stream because it was just so slow accelerating and decelerating. But I did end up resetting the, the, the EEPROM to factory defaults. So it's back to the slow acceleration. And I've just left it like that because that's how it's been provided. So that's what I decided to do these demo prints on. So there you have it, the BQBX from Big Tree Tech. And I just really wanted to get this video out, even though I had a few issues and a few glitchy buggy things that really pissed me off because it's actually a pretty interesting machine. And it's got some features like that hot end and extruder assembly that really are different. Um, the you know, Big, Big Tree Tech's trying some stuff that other companies aren't brave enough to try. And I think they need, they deserve props for that. However, I have to say it, I am not impressed with these companies using Kickstarter to launch these machines. They're large enough to do proper pre-orders and proper orders on their website without using Kickstarter. It's purely done for, you know, just getting the hype, getting people like me to hopefully say, please back this, it's amazing. But I am going to say back at your own risk because Kickstarter is not a store. Uh, it's a large company, but they actually don't have any obligation to deliver anything under the Kickstarter terms and conditions. So go read them before you back anything on Kickstarter. It is really basically a donation in the eyes of them. And I've seen too many Kickstarter campaigns in the past fail for me not to put that warning out. And please go check out Michael's review of the BQBX pre-production. Again, remember he has a pre-production unit um, because he went into a lot of detail with the other features like the Raspberry Pi integration. Check out the video description and go subscribe if you like his content. I'll see you guys very shortly here on Maker's Muse. Catch you later, guys. Bye.